When I first started cardiology, which is about 25 years ago, the excitement at that time was in acute coronary syndromes. It was just becoming the start of angioplasty, uh, putting balloons in coronary arteries unheard of. Heart failure was a disease that really nobody cared about except to say, you're going to die from this. This is a huge disease. It has impact both on hospitalizations, patients' well-being, cost to the community. The numbers are there. It's a massive growth area and we need to tackle it head on. And we know that of those people admitted to hospital, about 5% will die in hospital. About 50% will be dead at five years. We know that heart failure results in a huge number of hospitalisations. In 2012 that figure was nearly 50,000, uh, but the important thing is that it was contributory to about double that number of admissions to hospital. Uh, recent data, for example, has suggested as many as 1 in 10 people who are over 65 will at some stage manifest heart failure. I was getting these pains in the chest. I thought, oh, it's indigestion or something. And from what I believe now, that's what all us dopey men think. And, yeah, I come home, I packed up early, I come home and I got in the driveway and Nola pulled in behind me. She said, well, you doing home early. I said, oh, these pains in the chest, I just want to go to bed. And she said, no, you don't. I said, get in the car and I will take you to the hospital. So I drove him probably 20 minutes to the hospital. We were probably there eight minutes and they came out and said he's cardiac arrested. And thank God you were here because if you weren't, he would have died. And that was the first, that was the beginning of our adventure in life. John's a 68 year old man who's got a fairly typical profile of someone with severe cardiomyopathy. He had a myocardial infarct in 1998 and then about seven years later had bypass surgery. Had a mitral valve repair at the same time. He ended up unfortunately requiring further bypass surgery five years later and required a mitral valve replacement at that time. Importantly he's got a background of a number of factors that impinge on this. He's obese, he's got hypertension, he's got gout, Unfortunately, his obesity continues to be a significant issue for him and for us. If you look at the follow-up mortality for heart attack, acute coronary syndromes, it's come down dramatically. Heart failure hasn't tracked that. We believe that it's a result of lots of things. One, people coming to hospital in a delayed fashion. Two, the uptake in the community and in hospitals of appropriate heart failure treatment has been slow at best. And Three, they're often an elderly population with a lot of comorbidities. So this is a difficult population to treat. And they checked me off. They said, he's not having a heart attack. The next minute the surging pain come back and I dropped dead on the gurney. My whole world was taken out from underneath me. It was terrible. In a single day, we would see more than two or three patients with an acute exacerbation of their heart failure. In the first 10 to 15 minutes, the patient would have had an assessment done by a senior doctor in the emergency department, usually an emergency physician themselves up front, and a diagnosis or, or the steps towards making a diagnosis would all have happened within that first 15 minutes, as well as the initial investigations and management for a patient. I remember both times actually, come being out of the care but still being in oxygen. I remember friends coming in, and I couldn't talk because I had the tube in here. It is really overwhelming to see equipment, especially when someone's on, you know, an induced coma and 
on life support and everything that's around you is keeping that person alive. Well, they saved my life twice. Um, and the cardiac area section is bloody marvellous. It is, honestly. Um, they're just good. John's second bypass operation and mitral valve replacement were, not surprisingly, pretty difficult. He had significant left ventricular dysfunction going into the operation with associated severe mitral regurgitation. As a result of that, his recovery and in-hospital stay were fairly protracted. The most important part of the stay was, one, that he was deconditioned, and two, that there was a significant issue with fluid overload that persisted. We know that the readmission rates post one acute admission for heart failure are very high. And part of that is that the patients are going home not euvolemic. In hospital education is really one of the key components of heart failure care. It really is one of the most important things we have to reduce hospital readmissions. We know that about 25 per cent of people will be readmitted within 30 to 60 days of their index admission. And with that, there's about a, up to 10% mortality associated over that period. So reducing those readmissions is absolutely vital. The advent of the heart failure coordinator has, I think, been one of the most important additions to the heart failure armamentarium. The role of the heart failure nurse for patients in hospital here at the Alfred is to educate the patients firstly about how to manage their condition. They often go through a, a you know, shock, disbelief, oh my goodness, what's happened to me, my life's over, and then they grieve. They grieve for the life that they had. They know your name when you walk past. And you go, and I go at the moment now, every six months, and a loner will come through and say hello. Uh, to me, they're res no, respecting you, they're acknowledging you're not just a bloody number, that you're a person. It, you know, it, it, it makes them feel a lot better going in there. By the time they leave us, they've got to know everybody, we know them, and we have a relationship with them. It is very important that, these, that there's a good long-term management plan involving not just the hospital, but also the local doctor and the community, and be seen in the light of an ongoing, uh, permanent uh, care situation. Once the patient's discharged from hospital, the key things are to make sure they're discharged on evidence-based medications, so we know which medications they really should be going home on. We then need to make sure they've had a level of education and knowledge about how to manage their symptoms. We then need to make sure they've had referral to the multidisciplinary care team and that we've effectively communicated with their GP. We need to look at exercise and we know that once the patient is euvolemic, that exercise prescription is a vital part of their recovery. Cardiac Rehab is, you know, they're able to come along to the program and get further education and exercise in a safe environment. So they're getting guidelines of what they should be doing, not just here, but also at home. And um, it's a 12-week program that we offer them, and then we offer a maintenance program after that, which takes it for another three months. So it ends up being that they could be coming to us for about six months. And just, it's just seeing their confidence um, grow over the time they're here and being able to achieve a little bit more. Um, their emotional and their physical well-being just seems to improve over the time that they're on the program. It's what they actually get from each other, just having that chance to have a discussion. My name's Jennifer Eleanor Spendia. I, my age is 75 this past January. 
I'm congestive cardiac failure. And we were taken out for walks and we were put on walking machines and bikes and different things. And I couldn't live without it. The exercise and the knowledge and if they tell me to do something, I'm a good girl and I do it. Because I know it's for my health and my longevity. I would like, I'm 75, but I'd like to reach 95. He's pretty good at looking after himself now. I don't trust him with many things that he just used to do so naturally because he's not a, as confident as he used to be. It, it works pretty good though. It doesn't pump really well. The, the lungs are not the best in the world. I suppose that's because smoking for a long time. Uh, but I've been a bad boy lately, I've been doing exercise, walking. I've just got to pull my finger out and get up and start doing it. Um, I was going to buy a boat a few years ago. I wouldn't be able to push it in the water even. I think he's an amazing man to have got through what he's got through. One of the ways I feel a big burden is on Nola, that a lot of her friends have got caravans and go away. I can't do it. Um, and when we go away, she's always worried about where's the nearest hospital in case things go wrong. So the GPs are vital, they're the linchpin to this whole activity and without the GP often symptom management in the community is very difficult and the GP needs the right access to the right information at the right time. Samantha is a wonderful GP. Um, She's very knowledgeable and I trust her with my life. Jenna's very good at monitoring her health. In particular, she's very good with weighing herself daily, monitoring her fluid restrictions, at times monitoring blood pressure, and very, very good at being aware of what medications she needs to take and when she needs to take them, which is extremely important. Samantha's always on top of different things. If I get fluid in my legs or if I'm a bit wheezy, um, she doesn't hesitate to send me off to pathology to have blood tests done or send me back to the Alfred. If I'm not comfortable with something, that's when I feel like I need the specialist to be involved. It's also important that I get updated letters from the specialists and from the team so that I'm aware of what's actually happening you're getting out and about all the time. We're so busy, we're just as well of a pensioners. <laughs> but in terms of diagnosing earlier, I think we need to ask the question of people, are you getting breathless when you're doing things at home more than you used to? And they should be triggers for us to investigate things a little bit further. The flip side of all of that is that there's a person in all of this when we're managing someone with heart failure. And I can't imagine how hard it would be to have to struggle with it every single day. And when I walked in, he said to me, oh, your husband's a sick man. And I went, yes, I know. And he said, and how are you? How do you cope? And I thought, it's the first time a professional person has said to me, and how are you? And that was really important to me because I naturally started crying and broke down and let all these things off my chest that I carry around all the time. In a case like John, as a GP, I would just start with really little things and say, let's walk to the letterbox every day, three or four times. And you build on that. You build on really, really small things. I just hope that I can retire and that we can get out and do some things together. Just spend some quality time together. Harmonious quality time, and <laughs> yeah. I love the way he cooks. Come home to a nice hot meal, whatever he's cooked. He feels guilty that I go to work and he doesn't. 
So he says, if that's the least I can do, I'll cook you nice meal. And he is a magnificent cook. I think we've still got a long way to go with some forms of heart failure in understanding what's going wrong and in putting it right. I think there, I still believe that ultimately there's a lot, there will be some future in the new, whole new uh, cardiac replacement therapies, the whole stem cell story I think is a long way to go but I suspect that in, in fullness of time that will, be, that will be coming through. Our ability to transfer important key information is abysmal right now. And there are a number of ways in which that could be helped. I think that the good systems for communication lie at the bottom of this and those tend now to be computer based and, and requiring uh, funding support to do that. I think the provision of enough specialist heart failure services and, and connecting them with educational services is very important. Heart failure is already at epidemic proportions. We don't need any more figures to tell us that this is a disease that is one, of enormous concern now, two, is an enormous concern in terms of hospitalisation, three, it's an enormous concern in terms of cost. And if you want a fourth thing, just look 5, 10, 15, 20 years ahead. This is a problem that we have to tackle.